Yeah, we can just chat about whatever. Yeah, there we go. Then then we're ready. We're good. We're live. live. Yep. Well, watch out. Watch <laughs> out. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Push the button. Yeah, it's just one push of a button and it's all it's all unravels. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, how have yeah. you been, man? How have been you good. been? I've been good. Been jug- just juggling a, a few small projects, <laughs> a few small things. A few small things, like, just like getting yourself completely obliterated would work. Yeah, no, I have I got a bit of a break, but I'm just like, now I'm like, uh, you know, we're trying to build this um, this new business and it's kind of, it's moving quite quickly. And then I've got um, uh, some client projects that I was like, I'm really excited about finishing, but you know, just when you juggle a few things, it gets a little, yeah. a little hairy. But it's all like, it's all motivating, you know. It's all like really exciting. So yeah, yeah, I, I get it. I get it. I have way too many things on my plate, and I just keep adding more, more <laughs> stuff. It's just like exhausting. Yeah, I think the bit, the biggest, um, the biggest problem with that is like you know, I don't know how it is with you. I, I can only focus on like one thing at a time. But mm-hmm. I like to jump to do through like different subjects all the time, mm-hmm. and but when you do that, it's it's like really hard to focus and like gain that full momentum on something, and then you get stressed out that you have too many things to do. <laughs> oh, I know. Like I, I feel like I have capacity to do more than one thing, but it feels like as soon as I take on two things rather than just be like half productive, I feel like I'm a third productive. Like it's yeah. it's it just it doesn't. It doesn't scale. It scales. It scales inversely. Mm. <laughs> so it's like the more I, the toy, like if I take on twice as much, I become less than half productive. Right. So do you, do you ever take more than one job at a time? I mean, like not not there's a difference between taking few, you know, projects, mm-hmm. but then dividing your time between mm-hmm. like different days so let's say monday through tuesday or wednesday you're doing one project and then the the rest of the week you 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 know yeah you you put the time onto something else or do you ever like you know the day ends and oh i still got this this other thing to do yeah it's an interesting conversation because i'm usually i'm always up up front if i'm like with clients if, if i'm already on a project i'm like you know what i'm i'm stacked but then you'll you'll sometimes get those requests well like oh you know maybe you can like moonlight on this and do it on the weekends we'd be happy to have you and then it's kind of a weird conversation because essentially right then and there that project even though you're only maybe working on it a few hours after your full-time project technically those hours in my my perspective they're they're overtime hours like instantly they're overtime right so it's i don't think it's i think that has to be a pretty clear conversation with the clients like well you're asking me to work overtime even though you know i'm not putting technically overtime hours into your project um and i don't know it's like when you a lot of my if you want to call them every days are really just extensions of my client projects so mm-hmm. they're usually just like r and d right so i'll i'll take a client project and i have that conversation too it's like look i can spend 8 hours a day on your project um if I can just put some R and D stuff just as like my visual journal, uh, throughout time mm-hmm. <laughs> and put, put those as my everydays. Um, and usually they're pretty open because if not, then I can only spend, you know, five or six hours, but I'm still, you know, usually I, I do kind of value based pricing. I don't always do, you know, day rates or anything like that. I just mm-hmm. try and kind of scope out the project, but yeah, it's, a uh, it's an interesting conversation. It's, and it's pretty organic, but to, again like it's like you're juggling so much if if you if you just add that one more thing you know yeah it just becomes this thing where you f- you think you have time and it might might just so work out that you will mm-hmm. be performing pretty well but then the moment something happens like something unpredictable where let's say your your main client asks for like last minute changes that are pretty important and you know they have to be done yeah. Or, you know, something happens with the family. Maybe you have to go, you know, to a doctor or maybe you get sick. Exactly. Yeah. Those are you like have, the moments. You, <laughs> you have zero buffer, right? Like you have, you know, you're removing that little bit of buffer. And yeah, it can be pretty, pretty, pretty dicey. But um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's pretty I try, stressful. I, yeah, I'm trying to avoid it. Um, 
as much as possible um, with re- like just by booking long longer form projects, you know, mm-hmm. um, projects that take weeks or months instead of, you know, days. Um, I think that's that's been my saving grace, because once you have uh, like weeks or months in projects, you're not, you know, you're not like in the middle of a project that lasts only a few days or something and then wondering, OK, when's my next project going to come in? So you're not like as likely to do that, you right. know. Because you're like, ah, I'm, I'm, I'm working on this for three months, you know. Um, yeah, but, to me, yeah. three months is short. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. And that's an even a better situation, you know. I think having that, if you can have, like, consistency, still find time for personal work. Like, that's the, usually the first thing that gets displaced, right? If you're, if you're taking on another project, it's like, well, then where do you find time to do personal work? Yeah, exactly. Because usually, like, I don't, I'm pretty sure for you, personal work is, like, your full-time gig outside of your full-time gig. <laughs> oh, I wish it was like that. You know, I mean, it yeah. used to be like that pretty much past, I don't know, 15 years, but now I have a kid, you know, yeah. I had a kid for past couple of years and it's, it's when you, when you, when you become a father and you know, it's your kid is like a few months old. It's a little different because they all they do is just like shit and crawl and <laughs> th- that's it, you know, and yeah. eat. <laughs> yeah, totally. But once they become more sen- like sentient, a- you know, yeah, <laughs> then it becomes an issue because like, how are you going to explain to to that little kiddo that you have to work or like, hey, yeah. you know what, daddy has like this personal thing that needs to work that he needs to work on, um, and that's why I'm not gonna play with you. And it's like, what is work? <laughs> yeah, and then they look at you and they're like. What's more important than me? And you're like, ah, oh, god damn it! <laughs> you yeah, know? It's, it's not even that. It's just like it's complete lack of understanding. What the hell are you doing? You know? It's like, yeah, you, you don't want to play. What? <laughs> yeah, what's your problem? <laughs> yeah, what's your what's your issue, dude? <laughs> yeah, you like being a dad? It's pretty pretty awesome, I hear. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it can be challenging, dude. I bet. Can. Yeah, um, how was how was the little guy? Uh, it's a girl. Uh, oh right. Yeah, yeah. She's four already. Right. Believe it or not, time's flying like crazy. Um, yeah. It it's hmm. <laughs> Keeping you on your toes. <laughs> yeah, it's it's different. It's it's not like anything anyone else will tell you what it is like, you know, because it's just such a personal experience. Um, yeah. I'll tell you this. I mean, it's it's sort of related to being a parent. But and it's not really really not really related to parenting, but it's related to the experience of being a parent. Mm-hmm. I have completely newfound appreciation to films that right. involve kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's like so different. You know, I was just recently watching rewatching um Children of Men. Okay. Yeah. That that spoiler alert for all the assholes that haven't watched it <laughs> since it was like what released in two thousand nine. <laughs> bunch of idiots <laughs> um that scene when they are walking out from from that building with the, oh, with the child yeah, in their hands yeah, and like everyone yeah. just stops it just makes you think about the whole scene in a completely different light i remember watching it for the first time i was like oh it's such a cool scene like it, you know it's so well shot everything but now it's just like oh like this moment where people see a kid for the first time you know and you kind of like for 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 lack of a better word, you kind of relate to your own personal life a little better, right? Uh, which is kind of interesting. It makes makes me makes me watch the films in like completely different way, you know? Um, yeah, like a new lens on things. Exactly. I had the same experience with Interstellar, you know. Mm. Like mm. you would you would I would talk with a friend that you know has have no kids, and I was like, oh, it was okay, you know. Like I liked the movie; it was good. Uh, mm-hmm. I didn't like the the parenting part; it was lame. It's like. Dude, what are you talking about? It was so, <laughs> it felt so genuine. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. Um, that's awesome. So that gives you like a different lens. I guess that's the that's the the best way to describe it. You know. Hmm. Well, it's everything's like firsts, right? Like as they're growing up, everything's firsts for them, and yeah. I think that's that's nuts. Like, um, there's a thing I can't remember where it's like this random like chart, like why why life seems to speed up as you get older, because you know it's like it's like everything you're experiencing at a younger age is like a first right mm-hmm. so it's like you're 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 quantifying all these memories you know in the first however many years of your life and then as you get older you experience just like other versions of those that are not as like impactful 
you know, so time right. seems to just like go by because you're like, oh, I'm, you're not really creating any like new memories. Sometimes like when you're on holidays and you're totally unplugged, it, time seems to kind of slow down a bit. And yeah. I think that, I think it's pretty interesting. Like it's a cool analogy. Um, you know, as kids grow up, it's just always first, 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 you know? Yeah. Every experience that you take for granted, it's like a first time thing for them, you know, and just very easy to sort of dismiss that and, and not realize like how emotional they can be about simple things you know <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's kind of funny it's, yeah it's, it's really gonna be funny it's How like they you, pick up sorry go ahead yeah so i when you mentioned like unplugging because i like it immediately popped that question in my head you know like when you unplug when you go to places you 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 mentioned uh before we started you were you just went to hawaii you know just to completely relax how do yeah. you deal with this problem and i don't know if you have that problem at all but I do. <laughs> so I'm curious if you do. And if you, if, if you do, then how do you deal with that? Which is the moment you unplug and you know, like, I have time for myself. I don't have to do any work. And then you just start to stress out that you're lazy. The, mm -hmm. the, mo the, the world is moving ahead of you. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. like, what's going on? Like, well, I'm not working. I'm lazy. I'm the, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like do how you, you ever fall get that feeling? Yeah, I think, you know, what's ironic is like, I, I think it comes from when we were on the beach, like in Hawaii, I'm I, the only time that that ever occurred was when I kind of wasn't present to like where, where I was at. And mm -hmm. so that'd be like when you flip on your phone and you see like, oh man, like someone's doing something really cool or someone, else, you know, and I think that like that feeling of like, oh man, like I got to keep up. I got to be like, stay relevant. I got to, you know that kind of creeps up but i never noticed it when i didn't have those distractions when i really was like it took it always takes a couple of days especially on holidays it takes a few days for me to be like okay do i have any loose ends you know how, who's keeping the lights on um it's kind of an interesting organic mm -hmm. segue into some of uh, maybe some of the other stuff we'll talk about today but I actually before i before we left i licensed an image and while i was there i licensed an image and like right when we came back, I licensed an image. So, um, I think that in one hand, like, you know, it takes away some of the pressure to be like, you know, who's right. paying for this holiday, you know, cause when we're freelancers, you know, we're not getting paid vacation, you know, <laughs> you may be working it into your budgets, but I think it's, um, it's something that's always stuck with me is like how to like, as we get older, you know, we're starting to think more about like, what takes the pressure off of us when we're away from the screen. And I think that, you know, you know, passive revenue or passive development, even I, I look at it as like being on a beach, um, and watching sunsets is really just a different form of development. It's like, Oh my gosh, like my, my mind kind of needs this in order to, uh, come back with like a fresh set of eyes. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I think that that's kind of, yeah, I, I agree with you. It's always like that. I get initial uptick of like, oh my God, like, yeah, but don't I need to, don't I need to like do this? I should, I should, <laughs> I should be like taking photos of something or I should be like, and I'm like, no, like it's just, it's basically I'm elevating a different part of my life that maybe has taken a back seat to all the creative work. So I stop and try and, uh, shift, you know, shift that way. Yeah. So, yeah. You, you, yeah, it was right on the button when you said passive income, you know, like once you have those, uh, you know, revenue streams that sort of take care of the basic needs or at least like take away the full pressure on being always hired, being always, you know, performing to, you know, keep the lights on. That's where you can, I guess, unplug a little better, you know, <laughs> totally. or, or unless, you know, there's, there's always a... Uh, there's always an option where you just work for a studio, you know, your full-time employee, and then you sort of like a cure, a cure your vacation time. And then you can take that time off without any pressure. That's, that's mm -hmm. a possibility too. I remember when I was a naughty dog, I, I had that luxury, you know, like I always knew that the days I'm taking off, uh, mm -hmm. taking a, taking a time off to go for a trip or something, those were the days that were already paid for and you know they were already worked for and i didn't have to stress about like oh am i missing out or anything or you know is there is there something happening is there a client waiting for something like all, all those all those worries were not there mm -hmm. um 
there's a trade off obviously you have to work full time and you know your day always starts at the same time you have the zero flexibility on when you can go on vacations and whatnot just all sort of like project dependent as well mm -hmm. um but i remember that specifically to be like way more easy versus now where you know i'm freelancing basically and running my own business and like doing all those all of those things all at once and it's just like there's just so much noise on the daily basis mm -hmm. that it just gets really really uh, annoying once you like unplug and it's like ooh, am i missing out like ooh, should i be working on this maybe i should take a little time off during my time off <laughs> <laughs> i need time away from my time away <laughs> Well, yeah. yeah, like I got, I got it more when we came back. It was like, you know, it was a almost two and a half week trip where we went down to San Diego and then we flew mm -hmm. out to Hawaii. And then you know, when I got back, it took me like four or five days to be like, I, I think it actually, for me, it's more of a, um, it's more of, a, of an alignment on my principles and goals when I try and when I do get away, I can kind mm -hmm. of just like, I don't have anything kind of like just always coming at me. So you'd be like, okay, like, um, you know, look up for a bit and where am I headed? Is like, what's been going on? And you kind of reflect on what you left behind, you know, before you went on holidays. Maybe it's chaos. Maybe it's like this noise that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Just like so busy all the time. And then you go, okay, well, you, you, you get back from that holiday. And I remember coming back and being like, okay, like I need to kind of like shift here. Like I got to really prioritize a bit better. And I think you, you need to get away in order to see the, you know, the space that you've been playing in. Because sometimes when you're in the machine, you don't, you know, you're not able to, to see how it's working. And then once you go on holidays, you can step outside the machine and go, holy shit, like I've got a few things that, um, you know, w kind of got off the track and I need to, you know, get them back on track when I get back. So it took, it took more time. I think, you know, the same way it took three or four days for me to adjust to the vacation. It took three or four days for me to just be like, okay, I got to get back to work. I have to, these are, this is the way I'm going to start, you know, um, yeah, the work lag. <laughs> yeah. The work lag, but also like, you know, not jumping in and, and start answering a bunch of emails saying, you know, yeah, 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 sure. Yep. I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. It's really mm. like, yeah, just kind of, sticking to those some of those guiding principles a bit a bit more closely yeah i guess the worst thing you can do is go back from your vacation open up your email and start just committing to stuff <laughs> yeah it's like yeah it's like death by a thousand cuts right like you just start like these little leaks start to occur and then all of a sudden your boat's in, your boat's you know filling up with water and you're you're sinking so yeah I, I i was super grateful for it and and i would go back we were yeah in oahu like we're in Waikiki and it was crazy. Like it's, it's a big city. It was, I was never been there. It was a big city. Like, um, Vancouver is a big city, but Waikiki is like a tropical version of Vancouver. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so when we went to the North shore, it was like, you know, hopped in a Jeep and drove to the North shore. And the place we stayed at was super chill. And, you know, there's a balcony and played cars, you know, had a couple beers and literally like the only sound was the ocean just like mm. that was like right outside the backyard we were staying in you know so just yeah like almost uncomfortably silent and peaceful <laughs> for the first few days and then like yeah like I, so I think i said when i got back it was just like this buzz and this hum of the city was was back <laughs> yeah there's something in the air like when you go outside of the city to more rural areas especially if you go like way out you know of the uh, like of proximity to any civilization mm -hmm. it's just like the i don't know there's something different about the air like not only it's cleaner obviously you know if you're in the city it's you know it's smog and everything mm -hmm. um, i'm always curious if it's like all of the uh you know wavelengths from your wi-fi and you know connections and all that stuff it's, yeah. it's, it's like if that's affecting the way we think and and behave in general because like when you're you know when you when you when you go way out there to like a back country and and you go for a hike and there's like nothing but the wind yeah. it just feels so weird and eerie but also so beautiful at the same time you know it's just yeah. like a completely different experience and like almost always and that's 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 just me i always like would look up the phone and it's like oh no connection i'll be like stressing out a little bit <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 but then yeah. it's like yeah whatever <laughs> yeah you know, it's just life it's like 
it's like we're all like that guy off Better Call Saul. He has mm-hmm. like the allergy to all like the electrical stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like the opposite of that. It's like you go out and there's no Wi-Fi and you're like, oh, my God. Yeah. 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 No, I honestly like being in Vancouver, uh, to be totally frank, you know, we we don't take enough advantage of what's around us, you know, mm-hmm. Um but it's this summer, beautiful up there, right? This is, dude, it's like crazy, one of the best beautiful, snowy yeah. mountains for, for skiing and everything. Yeah, Whistler, Whistler is yeah. massive, and then like you go on Interior BC, there's so many other places to go uh, snowboarding and skiing. But then there's like the ocean, like right there as well. So yeah. it's yeah, it's you got the best of both worlds, and I think yeah, I just I watch it all from my home office. <laughs> so <laughs> the goal is to kind of get out and and uh, experience more of it. We got some. Uh, we got some family out in Victoria as well. So we get to kind of take those little like um, those little like two like the little seaplanes. Basically, they just mm-hmm. take off from downtown and yeah, they're pretty sweet. But that's a that's a nice little getaway as well. Nice. Yeah. So let's pedal back a little bit. And, uh, sure. You know, we've been talking about about unplugging and, you know, your work and and your licensing, like all of those are topics that we want to dive into a little deeper but mm-hmm. let's just maybe un- un- unravel this from like the very beginning because there's there's a there's a very interesting story on how t- how it went f- for you where you started to where you are right now and i would i really want to want to focus on that uh if you don't mind yeah for sure yeah what do you want to know <laughs> we're all started dude so let's let's start with like very simple because like there has to be there had to be some anchor anchor point that made you want to do what you're doing right Mm -hmm. what what was that point what was that moment for you yeah uh well my background's like in in visual communications and and uh, you know i got a degree in like graphic design um and i was i was older when i went back to school like i was working in the restaurant industry before and like was planning on doing like restaurants and service industry for my like whole career and right uh, the, the restaurant that I was working at at the time, I was also uh, I was also actually DJing uh, on the <laughs> side, which was a lot of fun, but um, it wasn't really sustainable. Um, but while I was doing those two things, I was playing around with Photoshop and you know learning Illustrator, and we were designing our own like club flyers, and mm-hmm. you know the restaurant heard of this and they said, oh, you know, we're doing some stuff, maybe you can <clears throat> help out with that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so uh, I started designing like menu inserts and like all this stuff that was like super kind of boring. And I said, and the company was growing. And I said, look, like if the company is growing, like why don't I actually like just take on this job as like more of like, you know, maybe a more of a creative direction, at least try and like inject some cool things into our. And they were like, you know, that's fine and dandy. Like, but we really just need you to be a restaurant manager. Like that's like, <laughs> and I'm like, and at the same time, you still want me to do this on the side? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, okay. And it was kind of at that point where I was just like, I'm going back to school. Like, I, I love doing this stuff to the point where um, I would decided to, like, enroll myself into a four-year program. Mm-hmm. You know, being a 20-something-year-old and and not having, a you know, a ton of cash, but just working in the service industry. So uh, I went through that, took out a student loan, and it wasn't too crazy, but... Um, I was one of the older students in the class and, you know, I did pretty well. It was a real challenge because I thought I knew a lot. And, you know, when they take you back to like foundational mixing paints and mixing colors and like doing all the stuff, I'm like, what the hell? I thought we were just going to learn more Photoshop, you know? <laughs> and they're like, you know, I did uh, drawing classes and the stuff that I really, really struggled with at mm-hmm. the beginning. Um, and then so I made it through, I actually made it through and, and, I did pretty well and I came out the backside of it uh, working at like a a really big digital agency and it was there that I kind of got my, uh, you know, feet wet with doing just a tiny bit of 3D Right. and I was was super stoked on it Um, but there wasn't really a space for it to thrive in that digital agency Um, even though I was trying to like pigeonhole like well maybe we should do it in 3D or maybe we should do it in 3D but it just, it it didn't fit all, all the time, right? So, um, and I wasn't that good. And I think at that point, you know, I realized that uh, I either had to like, again, shed what I call is like shed the layers of comfort and like 
go out on my own. So I went out on my own thinking that I would just be able to like pick up a bunch of 3D jobs or, you know, CGI stuff. And being in Calgary, there wasn't a whole market for it. <laughs> Calgary's like a oil and gas town. So I think unless right. I was going to do uh, explainer videos or something in 3D and After Effects, it wasn't really going to work. Um, so I kind of fell back to my traditional design roots and got back into like typography and like uh, did a bunch of... Um, uh, ironically, because I'd worked in the service industry, I did like some branding, like these bigger, bigger branding projects, like full, if you go back in my portfolio too, even on my current portfolio, I've, I've kept a, a couple of them in there because they were, um, I was actually, they put me on the map in, in some, some cases, uh, even on Behance and, uh, with mm -hmm. like typography served or like, like the their Briggs, kitchen and bar. Yeah, totally. Exactly. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, and that was really fun. Um, but then I was like, well, I want to get better at 3d and and i think you know obviously like like everyone does at some point i think uh i just l was looking online and looking for cinema 4d and you know i had bumped into uh mike's work and i was like oh man like this guy's crushing it and to see his progress like even through like how he dabbled in photography and like illustration and just to see i think in the first four years at that point um to see him progress as much as he did i was like oh like this is a thing like this is obviously like a, a an effective technique so i just promised myself i would do it for a year uh just like everyone else does and it's been almost yeah it's been over five years now um We're but talking yeah about I, michael wrigley by the way from oh no no i'm talking about mike Wink michael winkle oh yeah yeah okay yeah yeah so he's yeah and so the beeps. <laughs> the beeps yeah sorry i didn't i wasn't straight with that yeah, I saw, and then so I saw results, and within the first six months of that, I saw, I got like a licensing gig, which I had no idea about, so I had to go do research and ask questions and, you know, reach out to other artists that maybe had some experience, but then I kind of felt like I was just like humming along, like I was just doing the everydays kind of just to do them, you know, and my intentions weren't entirely clear. Um, and especially as social media picked up, I think it was easy to, to look around and be like, well, maybe I should be doing this or maybe I should be doing more of this. And what I realized, it's like, yeah, I got really busy with client work. So my everydays became more of a, like I said, like an R and D, like a visual journal so that when someone needs something, I can go back or even when, um, companies are curating or agencies are curating like a mood board or they want to expedite their process. I can say here, you know, here's what I'm suggesting. Here's some of the aesthetics that I've made or here's some of the techniques. Um, but yeah, anyway, so I ended up, um, just kind of uh, needing to progress. I was like, you know, on the mastery, you know, chart where there's the plateaus, right? Like you like climb a bit and then you have a plateau because you're just doing the same thing and you're getting kind of frustrated and then you have that push up to the next, the next climb. And then there's another plateau. Yeah. I was on a plateau and, and then obviously looking around, I was looking for some more growth and that's when I looked at learn squared and the, um, Michael Wrigley's class, uh, the first one, which was the design for production workflow. And that word kind of spoke to me because I was like, I don't really have one. <laughs> I don't really, I don't really I don't have, have the workflow. <laughs> I can do the work, but I didn't really have, think I, ha I thought that I had a work, the workflow. So I, um, mm -hmm. I jumped yeah, I right have, in. I have it open on my screen right now for, for people to actually see it. Whoever is watching them, watching it live or later on on YouTube. Yeah. So I ended up, um, yeah, I ended up just jumping in to that class, like with both feet, I cleared my schedule off. Um, and you know, it was the first time in a while that it was the first time since I kind of was like, you know, got my feet wet with 3d, just doing the, um, the first part of the everydays was that I felt that kind of feeling of like struggling, but like you're actually achieving something. You were just like running through a hamster wheel. You're actually like growing. So, mm -hmm. um, I came out on the, the backside of that class feeling like uh, really good. And, um, you know, that opened a bunch of doors for me. Like I can't, I can't go into s like super specifics, but some of the, the best paying jobs, um, uh, came out of that. Some of the, you know, the largest licensing deals came out of that as well. Um, and you know, that extended. So obviously when I had the opportunity to do the mentorship with Mike, uh, on the animation class, I was like, I'm all in. And, and that class kind of almost did the same thing as the production or the, yeah, the workflow class. Mm -hmm. So 
yeah, I think that's kind of where, if we look at where I'm at now, I have more of that workflow and I've continued to kind of develop that workflow and try and try to look at, you know, I think a lot of things have changed even since those classes came out in our space of like tools and assets. And you look right. at like, you look at things like substance and you look at things like Quixel and you see all the, you know, kit bash and all these, you know, tools and assets and, and all knowledge that are, you know, really creating a space where it's competitive, which I think is awesome, which will force the cream to rise to the top. But it's also forced uh, me to kind of adjust my workflow and fl- find uh, efficiencies. You know, uh, right. people, Mike, he speaks to, you know, he says his motto is use everything, you know, and I think that's, that's a, that's a huge, you know, a huge um, asset, I guess, is, is a way to find authentic ways unless a client's going to tell you that they want something super super specific Mm -hmm. but it does take away a little bit of the technical learning and it a lot sometimes allows some more like hey i can actually come up with a concept and i'm not buried you know in modeling a screw for this piece of wood or something so right yeah yeah, so I just I, I think that I've continued to try and find efficiencies in the in the program with, uh, in Cinema 4D and um, the the next kind of like it was honestly one of the best uh, opportunities I had was doing the R20 uh, like the Cinema 4D R20 key visuals that was like you know that was just a milestone for me to be able to like to to give to to develop you know creative work for the company and the software that has like empowered me for the last six years, you know? Right. Uh, Do you have that in your portfolio somewhere? No, I don't. Ironically enough. Yeah, (laughs) no, I don't. (laughs) If you guys aren't sure what it is, just fire up cinema 40 and it's, yeah, it pops up. And, um, yeah, I think that was a really, uh, wonderful opportunity. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at now. Yeah, it's. I remember you were you were taking the apprenticeship with with Michael, and that went pretty well. You know, like remember seeing the progress was pretty cool. That class is so good. I mean, I've I've I remember watching the class myself a couple of times. Uh, I'm not into like Cinema 4D specifically, but one of the things that Michael like explained so well that I use till today mm-hmm. is the way he got he goes about you know folder structures and naming conventions. It's just like dude, you just solved all my problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's awesome. So even, even that, like I've, I've been able to like take that and like, you know, I use, I don't know if you use post haste, which is a wonderful little piece of software, but post haste, like just makes that process even more powerful. Mm, um, it's, Obviously. it's really, really cool. Yeah. What is it called again? It's called post haste, like P O S T and then H A S T E. But really, once you have that file and folder structure, you can just duplicate it. And then you can like, you can make templates of templates within that. So if you have a premiere template that you always use for motion graphics or whatever, you can put that premiere template inside of the you know, the post haste template. And then when you start a new client project, it'll create the folder structure, but it'll also create a uniquely named premiere project file that has that's in that folder structure. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah, I'll definitely check it out. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's like neat. this is pretty like especially if when you work when you work on a larger project. On a smaller project it doesn't matter that much. Mm-hmm. You might have just a couple of files. It's, it's pretty easy to navigate through folders to find them. Yeah. But on like specifically large projects, especially the ones that take months. Oh um, god. You get yeah. so many different files and it's just like once you if you don't organize them, then it's just very easy to get lost, you know. Oh my god, yeah. Yep, yeah. it is. I just got off the back end of a um, a uh, long term project that you know involved a lot of awesome artists uh, from around the world, and it was like it was really that was super critical. Like just having that system and having like the shot list and yeah, it was. I would have been buried in assets because they were just they were coming from all angles there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How do you how did you apply yourself when when it comes to like you know taking Michael's classes and just generally you know putting yourself to through this this grinder of working towards a goal you knew you're you're in the spot where you need to progress you were like you know I, I guess everyone 
eventually finds out that they're in this creative plateau and you know you have to change something right mm -hmm. um how do you how do you go about that specific moment where you, you when you come to that realization where it's like oh like hmm okay what i'm doing like it does not necessarily have a purpose anymore or mm -hmm. it's not reaching the goals that i i have you know set for myself what now I have, I think, I have, I think a lot of people will have that question. They will ask themselves, and you know, I, I find myself asking that question a lot of times. You know, in in some terms, I'll find the answer, and okay, this is probably what I need to do. But then you never know, obviously, if you're if you're going the right path. But uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I'll be curious, like how you specifically approached uh, that subject, where it's like, okay, I'm in the plateau, I need to do something about it. What mm -hmm. what what now? You know yeah i think it's like every like at the back of your mind you know what you ought to do right like there's just like you know what's right. going to take you to the next level uh but there's this blind spot i think that's that you don't see is actually like counter like countering that that like it's a basically a, in my head it's like a blind spot that i can't hear it talking or i can't see what it's doing but it's it's arguing with that thing that i know i ought to do so, you know, whether, if that makes sense. So like, uh, let me give you an example. So if I'm like, okay, like I want to learn substance painter, if that's the thing, like that's my next challenge. That's the next thing I want to grow. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, that comes at a cost. And sometimes that, co that comes at a time cost or a looking bad cost. Cause you may suck for a bit or it comes out of a, f I think it's fear maybe is the best way to sum it up. It's like some fear that you're not recognizing that's maybe preventing you from jumping off the off the edge and just going for it. <laughs> like it's the fear of, I think the fear of many things. Like like for me, sometimes it's just for the fear of looking bad. You know, yeah. If I'm I totally honest, has that fear. <laughs> yeah. And I think what I think the if I was to look uh, give the example of of the class, I was more fearful about looking bad by not finishing it than I was fearful of sucking. Mm -hmm. So it kind of put me in action. Um, and I think that, that that's sometimes, you know, some, I think unless you declare something to you, like out, outside of your own personal space, you probably won't take action, you know? Yeah. Um, but when it comes to, a, I've got this, yeah, I, I think it's like this mechanism where I just go, oh, oh my gosh, like I'm either fr super frustrated and I don't know why, or I'm I'm kind of like more like, there's this challenge or, or even when you're looking outside, you're like, Oh man, like that person's doing something amazing. And usually there's just like innate desire to be like, I wish I could do that. But that comes from a place of ego. Right. So you're like, well, yeah. is, is that the thing that I even want to do? Or do I just want to do that? Because I see like how good it is because they did it. And, and I think that's, you kind of like, that's why I, say, I use the word principles. It's like, well, what are your principles? What, how do you want to, how do you want to grow where you're going? What's what is honestly like if you turned everything off and went back to the beach, let's call it, what do you want to do? And then ideally maybe you share that with people outside of just people you're comfortable with, whether like that's uh, Mike Beeple, he, you know, that's why he puts it on, on, on Instagram or on whatever he puts it out there so that it triggers like this. You're, you're not going to, um, you're not going to put something shitty out to the world or you're going right. to at least try not to. But if you keep it internally, then you're likely to be like, uh, oh, and you'll probably compromise your own arguments and say, well, maybe I'll put this out tomorrow. And then tomorrow turns into a week later. And then a week later, you know, you're back to doing all your old bad habits. Yeah. Yeah. Like stopping yourself from actually, you know, making that first step, which is the, the, the most important one. And it's just like your ego gets in the way because you think, I always have to deliver well, like because I saw someone doing it on the highest level. If I don't do something that is at least comparable, then I failed, you know, but you didn't. You you mm -hmm. actually took the first the most important step, which is actually starting and mm -hmm. doing and doing it and then recognizing that it's 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 not perfect. It's not maybe it might actually suck, but you will never get better if you don't you know expose yourself to that critique and, and show it first and then try to improve it you know mm -hmm. every every day so yeah and i think it's like it's gonna take time you know it's a, it's gonna take time and i think the the whole 
um, the whole thing is like uh, sometimes artists be like, "Okay, I want to, I want to do this. I want to, I want to master substance, or I want to master, you know, a tool, or or learn this technique and 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 make this thing." But that takes time, and I feel like that's like if you maybe put some parameters, like this is going to take six months. Mm-hmm. This is going to take six months before I even start. The problem is that we're looking at, you know, and I do it too. I'm looking at something that uh, an artist who has probably spent years crafting that that thing, not not that specific thing, that, but over time he's learned to craft it that way, that aesthetic or that tool or that software. But you're sitting there going, okay, I want to do that, but you have no, you can't quantify the word that. What is it that they did? You don't know. Yeah, you see the the picture and you're trying to digest what what you're ac- exactly looking at. What is it built off, you know? Is there any plugins that they're using specifically to make it? Like it looks beautiful, should I make it by hand? Try try different things. <laughs> it's just so easy to get lost, you know. Yeah, and and to try and quantify exactly the path that they went down is going to be nearly impossible. And even if you're trying to achieve what they're doing, it's probably going to take you know it would take a person an entirely down a different path entirely. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's got their own little journey. There's so many talented artists out there. And I think the most talented ones, um, maybe are the ones that haven't, that, that are, they're not dabbling. Like they, they, they're kind of on track, you know, and, and they're willing to like see the new shiny thing, you know, and, and let it go you know, and see the next shiny thing or something different and like let that go and then just kind of hold the course a little bit. You know, they're always developing, but they're, they've are they got their kind of thing. And I think that's where you start to see that thing grow and evolve in its own form rather than the, the, the core thing always changing. Yeah. yeah. Right. You know, like it's like, oh, I need to go learn, you know, this software and now okay now i've i i tried that i don't really like it maybe i need to go uh, learn this software so it's like it is in that mastery book again it, it's just like you get all excited but you can't maintain that excitement over the course of time yeah i wonder if it's um it's it's, it's kind of interesting that that part specifically like maintaining excitement about something um whether it's based like there's just there's just two reasons for it one it could be it's not for you specifically, meaning, you know, that this kind of workflow, that those kind of tools are just not jiving with the way your creative mind thinks. Therefore, you might want to just search for something else. But it can also be a, you know, uh, the, the reason behind all that could be just you're, you're not sticking to your guns for long enough mm-hmm. and you give up too early, you know? Yep, Totally. And yeah. I would say it's the latter most of the time, right? Yeah. Like you don't get a chance to actually experience this excitement because you come into the you come into it with that much excitement, and that really has nowhere to go. Mm-hmm. And you know, in the first development, you know, for it to develop, it, you know, that excitement just depletes quite quickly, and it's not sustainable. So then you don't aren't able to maybe get over that first little like, oh, like oh, like all the dopamine's hitting you up front, you know. So how do you <laughs> how do you sustain it when you actually do something uh, interesting, you know? So yeah, I think I think it lies with the with the fact that we are generally our attention spans are getting worse and worse over time, and it uh, the, the 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 primary reason for that is we're trying to engage with too many things all at the same time, which mm-hmm. is sort of like what we started where we started with in the beginning of the discussion, you know, like juggling too many, too many balls and trying to, you know, still look like a professional juggler, you know, (laughs) eventually, like if you have way too many, it's just like, it's going to look impressive for a second, but once it collapses, it's just, it's just going to look really bad, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. It's just finding that balance, I guess, and, and sticking to, to your, to your guns and picking up a project. If you're learning something, then unless it's it's clearly you know running it running you into a dead end there's if you're giving up too early then you're not going to achieve and you're not going to find your voice you know learning this new thing yeah i think that's one of like i i've that's one of the most important um factors when i look at requests come in is to check myself at the front door a bit and be like rather than be like, yeah, I can do, I can do anything, you know, I can do this. Like, I think it's, that can get kind of 
if you tr- have that mentality going into a client project that's that is already questionable um you're not doing i think anyone any favors like there mm-hmm. there needs to be time if if you don't know that skill set you know or if i don't know that skill set i look at it i'm like do i have time to learn this a and then b do i even want to learn this is this thing that i'm going to learn for this client project something that I, I I was intending on learning anyways, right? Because if it's not, then you're adding like it's like a you know a mechanic. You're adding an electrician's toolkit to a mechanic's toolkit, and that just makes no sense. Like, why are you compiling tools that you're not going to use, um, you know, down the path that maybe you want to use long term, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's kind of like that master of or jack of all trades master of none it, it the, the argument goes both ways generalist versus specialist but i i think that maybe i know it sounds weird but maybe you can be both if you as long as you have that guiding principle right that i'm this is what i want to master right. and if there's little offshoots that that you have to kind of dabble in but you turn them off um because you, you know some people do got to keep the lights on right you got to pay the bills sometimes oh, yeah of course of course um but I, I would, I pers- would say most. <laughs> yeah, but personally, like, if you're, if you're the best at what you're doing, you know, and if you're the best for that thing, and you've got that voice or you've got that authenticity, and you've you've carved out a niche that's so deep or or a look that's so authentic, you're likely not going to have to dabble in a bunch of other things that you don't want to learn in order to pay the bills. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. you, you're yeah. you're going to be known for that that thing, um, and I think that uh, that has value um, for sure. It definitely does. But don't you think that it's it's um it's a it's a very risky game because the mm. one thing you're doing, yeah, you're you're kind of exposing yourself where to to a point where if someone if if someone else else comes in, yep, and becomes equally as good as you but maybe more competitive yeah in terms of their their approach to like they let's i don't know let's put let's put an example um (laughs) yeah people is a good example but um i don't know i don't i don't think people okay people is a person that i don't think there's too many people that have the 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 force of will, of will to mm-hmm. maintain this kind of output. Let's put it this way. Like this is, t- to me, that's his biggest strength, right? Sure. But what he does, it's not necessarily a speciali- specialization. Nope. Like it's that's not, right. That's it's true. It's not a specialized thing. Yep. Um, I guess better example would be, I don't know, let's let's talk about maybe Vitaly Bulgarov. You, I'm, yep. You, yep. If you've seen his work. He's yeah, probably just... one of the best hard surface you know, designers out there mm-hmm. in terms of like robotics and whatnot. Like if you think, if you think ro- like robots and hard surface design, that's the first name that comes to mind, you know? Yep. Um, and, and he's on the, such a level, it's, it's almost impossible to compete. Right. Yep. But only on the very top of the market, meaning the clients that he is working with are going to be the clients that are seeking for that perfection. Yep. There's not many of them, though, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. versus you can find a lot of like, I, I call them Vitali babies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or people babies or, you yep. know, like yep. basically someone who wants to do whatever he's doing, but it's, but they're not doing on the, they're not doing it on the same level and okay. they're trying way too hard to be him. Right. Right. Um, and so when you have that, that that's like you can get to a point where you you're actually taking away the market from from the master mm-hmm. because a you might be working faster but arguably i i don't know i, I guess I guess there is no way anyone can ever work faster than Vitaly. it's probably the worst example i could ever chose because <laughs> he's a skynet yeah uh, <laughs> um but you know the, the for the sake of the argument you you can become like semi-specialist with way more optimized performance because you know what you're doing is for different goals you're doing it for quantity not quality let's put it this way but you've reached enough quality to actually get to the market point where people look at you in the same way that they look at vitali for instance right 
Right. Because one thing I've I've realized, and I, I'm curious what your uh, what your what you think about that specifically is. I, I think the vast majority of the market have pretty low bar in terms of what they want quality wise. Mm -hmm. but they do have but they also have a pretty amazingly low bar for how much they want to pay it pay pay for it you know yeah and there is just maybe you know a handful of outliers that recognize the quality that comes with you know the mastery and mm -hmm. then they pay premium because they know how this 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 part is essential for this huge machine that it has to work in perfection to make to make a difference in the world you know and, and be, argument would be look at apple look at you know amazon like look at look at any of the biggest players mm -hmm. in the market and how they approach how important for them it is to have the best people working on it you know mm -hmm. uh, i'm curious what you think about that you know like the fact that the market is like their bar is pretty low because mm -hmm. i i think it it, it is yeah, I agree. I think that um, your analogy about like the you know Vitaly babies or the uh, Beeple clones, um, you know, when you talk about the the the, re I think the word is like resilience, right? Like mm -hmm. probably the resilience and development and growth that you know Mike or Vitaly or guys that just stick through it. Um, they the, what they experience is almost like a level of professionalism. Um, and mastery that maybe any one of those other um, knockoffs or emulators, let's call them, mm -hmm. you know, they may not, they, they just haven't experienced that, right? They've seen something and then they've just done that thing. Whereas the masters had to go, what is the thing that I wanted to do? And I think that right. they'll always go the distance, whereas the emulators will start to get picked off by other emulators, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know? <laughs> and, um, in terms of evolution, when the time comes to evolve, I believe that the you know the uh, the Vitalis and the Mikes will find a way to evolve. You see it in Mike's work yeah, already, sure. right? Sure. You see, it, he's 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 just you know growing and finding smart ways to work. And um, that's actually a you good know, point. You were mentioning that you know because they've reached that mastery, they know the road that they have to go with to evolve and change, and they will recognize when the change is necessary much quicker than anyone else. Yeah, like they're ready to leave it behind, you know, yeah. whereas the the emulators are like, they're chasing that work that's already been, maybe the market's already absorbed and gotten tired of, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so that makes sense. Yeah, so I think that, you know, uh, I, 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 yeah, I just believe that the masters will go the distance, whereas if you don't have, if you maybe you don't have that, um, experience that you might not or 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 that desire to find that that voice or or to or to solve interesting problems that are your own um i think that you you might get lost in in, in that in the in the the pool that is 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 yeah is just trying to still find their own voice yeah yeah i agree there's something about there's something to, to be said about that you know like going to distance and actually trying to explore finding your voice working working really hard towards becoming yourself in terms of you know not only just getting good at something and and finding if if that's the right software sticking sticking your guns and uh, you know staying long enough to actually recognize if it's helping you or not but then also uh you know pursuing that mastery it, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned the argument between generalist and and, and the master you know mm -hmm. and i think I don't think being one or another is better. Mm. I don't think being in between is better either. I mm -hmm. think it's a combination of this flow where you pursue the mastery uh, as, and as you're doing it, you recognize the hallmarks of how to become a master of a specific thing, but also where are the traps and where are the moments that you have to pay attention to because they can drown you really quickly. And once you start to, like once you learn through you know success and failure how to recognize those hallmarks then ability to change for you will, will be it will be much easier for you to change and find something new and adapt and you know evolve than just like if you're if you're just a generalist and 
you're always in this like lower niche market and always competing against hundreds of thousands of other generalists, you know, or if you're just a master of one thing, but you never adapted to change and, you know, there might be a software, hardware or another person who is more efficient than you that comes in and just literally, you know, swipe you swipe you off the the surface of, of the market, you know? Right. Yeah. yeah. That makes yeah. sense. It's a it's an interesting argument both ways, you know, like the the generalist specialist thing. Um, I think that ev like everything's evolving so quickly. Yeah, it's um, kind of insane. Yeah, it's like how do you how do you even become a specialist in something like you? I think we talk about this I think about like ideas. Good ideas will trump everything, and I believe that. I think that it's like I always the, my analogy has always been like a fifty one forty nine. Like yes, good ideas are. Um, are great but unless you have the 49 percent um thing to execute them like if you have you, mm -hmm. the idea is always more important but you can't you can't have a great idea and only be able to execute it 10 percent, or else it just doesn't work yeah you know what i mean so i think that uh i think that both the tools are very important to executing the ideas but um yeah that's where i'm at yeah the idea has to be executed in a way that people actually can understand it you know so it's mm -hmm. not just words unless it's like a script I guess that's different but if you're if you're a visual person and you have a great idea but your tools and craft are not are not good enough to express that idea then yeah you you, you might be failing f failing yeah it's like if you present a client like a great idea right and you're like i've got this great idea and you you know uh, you run into i run into it sometimes you do a sketch and and they think that it's a good idea but then when you go to execute it visually it, sometimes it doesn't fill that gap because you're not a master yeah. in that mm -hmm. space so while it was a good idea if it's not executed well then yeah that great. can happen a lot where you sketch something like shit this is so good and then you start like chiseling all the details is like oh it's it's losing that effect you know <laughs> yeah. you had in the first place like ah what's yeah going on? i hate that it happens to everyone you know yeah absolutely but it's it's it's, it's definitely yeah once you get once you get better at it it's it's much easier to control mm -hmm. um you mentioned something in the um, i guess it would be a good segue you yep. know when you mentioned you know, we're talking about your trip to Hawaii and, you know, unplugging and, and having those elements that kind of work for you and, you know, so that you don't have to always be grinding and always be thinking about, okay, what's the next thing I have to latch on in order to survive, you know, pay the bills, keep the lights on. And there was, there was an interesting topic that you've mentioned and, and you know, people in the chat, I was like, what, what? What, what is this <laughs> yeah um and it's about licensing and i know we we have uh, a pretty interesting topic when it comes to that because there is more to it not not just licensing but you have something else in plans right yeah yeah we've been it's been a couple years um it, like just for me like a problem that i've been trying to solve i've i've really like I've had these experiences of licensing my personal work, work that I never. Yeah, let's get get, get into that first. Like, yeah, how how does it usually works for you? I mean, I I understand the process more or less uh, uh, myself, but someone who's listening might be just like, what are you talking about? Like licensing images? Like, how does it work? Yeah, well, the, I guess the short of it is, if someone needs to use your stuff to to. You know, if they just if people need to use your work for something, um, it's got value. And at that point, no matter if it's personal work or, you know, something that you've spent months on or a day on, it has value to them. Mm -hmm. So having an understanding based off, you know, determining how much value is some, sometimes pretty subjective. But you um, mean something more than free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Something more uh, that can be paid with exposures. Yeah, more exposure, <laughs> more exposure bucks. <laughs> I tried to take some exposure bucks over to Starbucks, and they they wouldn't accept that yeah, either. Exactly. Like how I went to grocery store and was like, "Here's my five <laughs> exposure bucks. Can I pay for my groceries?" And I was like, no. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a. It was something that 
uh, I just over time started to experience more and more of and tried to get a better understanding of it. And I have some experience going through my degree with photography, like I minored in photography. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think photography is a better a better space that's been more established over time you know, to kind of find those benchmarks and pricing approaches when it comes to licensing, but it's no different. It's no different at all. It's just, I think that our, our work to some extent, you know, when it comes to CGI and stuff has far more flexibility and value and, and that should be recognized, you know, so just, you know, it's easy to come up with nicer images for sure, but there's more flexibility in it, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I've over time have tried to solve uh, the issue for myself. Um, how can I eliminate, how can I eliminate the constant, um, uh, kind of back and forth, uh, with licensing requests? How can I mitigate, um, uh, what I call as junk license requests where it's just like, you know, they're expecting something for nothing. Uh, and you know, is, is it a problem that, that, other artists are experiencing and um throughout the last few years i've tried to establish my own kind of um ground rules for licensing and i've built out like spreadsheets so that i don't have to think about my pricing and i've built out Mm -hmm. you know uh licensing structures and and legal you know uh contracts and stuff like that to protect myself and the client um but it's You know, I've even gone as far as setting up like a licensing category on my Shopify site, Um, (laughs) but it doesn't really work, right? Because clients, they don't, you know, they're not going there to license my work. It's usually they see it and then they just want to contact me. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, I've been trying to solve this problem and and I was contacted by, you know, a number of uh, larger companies uh, over the years to basically take, uh, you know, my volume of work and put it on platforms that uh, were were not were known, but when I you know when I do the research and you look at you know it, they just were not very great platforms. You know they were the big ones um, that have millions and millions of assets, which are really you know low quality, and there's no there's no there was no space for me to really feel like okay, like my work's going to be mixed in with all of this kind of garbage, let's call it, um, or just you know, noise. stuff that was noise. Yeah. Total noise. Um, and the payouts were really, really, really low. You know, you can Google payouts for, if you want to call them stock companies, but they were really, really terrible. And then I started to kind of think about it. And I was like, Oh, you know, like maybe there's a space for this. Um, and so, yeah, I started talking to some other artists and over the last few years, like it was even like as far as like, I think Sigraph uh, in Vancouver a couple years ago, I just kind of had my ear to the, to the, to the floor a bit and just wondering like, Hey, like, you know, what are artists saying about licensing? What are they charging? Do they know what are their frustrations? And there was a ton of, um, there was a ton of little golden nuggets throughout the years that I was like, I think, I think this is something that, you know, I should explore. And so I started kind of, uh, toying around with the idea of building a space where artists who have put the time and energy into to develop their craft and for myself to have a space for this work that I'm making, um, not all of it, you know, some mm-hmm. of it, um, to to remove that pain point, right? Like just remove all that stuff so that they feel supported and confident that there's a platform where they can go and put their stuff um, and yeah, and then not have to go through all the shit that I went through, <laughs> ideally. <laughs> um, and yeah, and it's and it's and it's happening, which is crazy. Um, it's a lot of work. Like you asked me, you know, like how many, how am I spinning plates? I'm like, that's a that's a constantly spinning plate right now. Um, it takes a lot of work, and it's but it's super motivating, man. I can't tell you how much when I speak to artists um, from around the world that are interested in this thing. Um, when I just talk to them about like what they're experiencing, uh, you know, the challenges that they have, what they're interested in, you get every, like every, um, you get a whole gamut of responses and problems. Some artists just didn't even know it was a thing. You know, some artists, uh, don't know that, you know, they're supposed to charge, you know, what, what usage is. And so, yeah, it's, it's just really inspiring to be able to talk to those, um, artists and actually realize that it's a, a, a problem or a space that, uh, 
that is worthy to play in for sure. So, yeah, let's plug it in. It's uh, Av Avant Form, yeah. Yeah, Avant Form, uh, which basically just represents a new form of medium. It's a it's a new form of licensing. It's a new form of of digital. Um, you know, you know, we're doing everything from really established 2D artists uh, and illustrators and concept artists uh, all the way to like 3D. Yeah, got some names here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got a got a few on on good, there. Good portfolio of people that decided to join the platform. Pretty awesome. You have Beeple, you have Alex Fugini. Alex uh, was actually one of the instructors of Learn Squared as well. That yep. guy rips, dude. That guy rips. Yeah, he crushes it. I've still got his class sitting in my in my back catalog. <laughs> Um, he was actually one of the artists that helped me on that long project. It was really, mm -hmm. um, really awesome working with him. He's also uh, now a dad, which is cool. But yeah, yep. Um, Alex. Yep. And so, yeah, and try not to like pigeonhole um, what digital creators are, and just kind of opening this up to to um, everyone to apply, and then really, you know, kind of kind of curating a site that gives every artist, you know, a space to play in. Um, gives their own corner, you know, to 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 thrive. And the thing about it is, it's like you can get these requests from other companies that, um, you know, I don't know who's, you know, building them or anything like that. But the fact is, is like this is a platform that I really want to thrive on as an artist. So it's got some really nice checks and balances in it, right? Because mm -hmm. you know, it, it can't thrive unless the artists thrive, and I can't thrive on, you know what I mean? Like so it's really nice and organic that way. And it's not really, you know, it's not a difficult conversation. You know, we are, you know, doing a lot of interesting things. You know, I can't get too far into the, the, the nitty gritty of all the details, but we're doing some real, yeah, we're doing some really, really interesting things, um, to give artists, you know, the most back out of, out of what this, uh, platform is doing. Yeah. You know, not, we're not looking to be like the Uber of licensing, <laughs> you, want to you know, the lift of licensing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I've really been able to, you know, have good conversations with the guys and girls that are are, are behind this, um, and it's uh, it's gaining a ton of ton of steam. Like it's gaining a ton of momentum. We just put this site out, I think, just a, maybe a month ago, um, and you know, we've had hundreds of applications. We're working really hard to get through all of them. It's actually just me going through and trying <laughs> to figure out, you know, talk to you know our small By team. By we, you mean you? <laughs> yeah. And just, I know how it works. <laughs> yeah, and like I said, it's the ship pulling up to the port, right? Like yeah. it's like, um, but there are a ton of artists, you know. I think that I really want to um, support and also give the opportunity and just like just be in touch with um, because, yeah, I think it's a really you know. There's so much. When I the reason I thought of this is there's so much there's so much out there in terms of knowledge. Right. So there's yeah. so much knowledge is so much more accessible, you know, um, uh, tools and assets are so much more accessible. Right. So people are artists are just creating these magnificent things without being able to like, you know, they're just creating tons of beautiful personal work that sig has significant value if yeah. someone decides to use it. Right. So the thing that we don't have um, is a space where actually <laughs> where this stuff can go. And you can feel confident that you're not going to get, you know, dicked around by a client or dicked around by some place that wants to use your work for free. Yeah, um, that's the worst part about it, you know, like the the inability or like lack of transparency. And it, it, you can't. I mean, it's not like I want to blame the industry for it personally, but it's just like you know, um, it's very difficult to find that information because people who are actually taking advantage of the fact that you know, being not, well, taking advantage of pretty simple principle, don't, don't fucking work for free ever. Yep. Don't do it for free for anyone. Unless ever. it's, unless it's your grandma. Uh, yeah. Unless, you know, it's a little different when you, when you work with family work, when you do fun stuff with family, or if you, if you start projects uh, that you do with friends for fun, like that's, that's obviously a, a little different thing, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's kind of surprising uh, that people just don't realize that and they still work for free or they undervalue the work that they do so dramatically. It's, it's, it's insane. You know, it's just like this ever never ending, you know, downward spiral that, that just makes the art to be a commodity. Mm -hmm. And then everyone is outraged. Like I'm an artist, you know, I'm doing creative work. I'm, I'm working my ass off 24 seven, you know, it's, it's, 
if you want to be really good at it, you're not going to be working eight hours a day. That's not enough to become really good at, at the craft. Um, you're going to pour your soul in. You're going to, you're going to, you know, say no to friends a lot. Don't go like we will never go out or not never, but you will rarely go out and just work your ass off to get to, to a point. And then at the end of it, what you see is, is a client saying, Hey, I'll pay you an exposure. <laughs> <laughs> it's so brutal <laughs> it's just like what well and <laughs> and the other you? yeah well and the other part of it is um there is so much content right and in the space that people are you know and artists are looking and and you know maybe you know like guys like vitaly and and mike they're not they're not looking there for guidance or inspiration like when we talk mm -hmm. masters right they're not getting distracted by it they're leveraging you know kind of maybe some inspiration we're all looking for you know inspiration somewhere but yeah. i think it's one thing to look for inspiration on a platform like facebook or instagram or pinterest or anything like that but the issue is is when when it becomes that you're looking for inspiration and then it becomes emulation and then you're just everyone's emulating other people and you know now you've got a ton of content that you know the masters are doing well or the ones that have found their voice are doing really really well but then the artists that are <laughs> maybe not doing too well are you know you're just getting lost in a sea of content yeah and it becomes I'm I'm interested because then it seems like it comes a popularity contest rather than artists that are actually looking to be successful as professionals and be paid for their craft. Like you that's mean the amount to me. of likes on Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> like, like if that matters. <laughs> yeah. But but to to in this day and age it seems to matter, you know, in the form of online communities and online this. It's like these the, the smart ones are leveraging content, right? Like if you look at Instagram, there's so many communities and uh, there's just this way that the content becomes consumed, but it doesn't benefit the artist. You and mean what, the profiles that basically take your photo and just tag you if they if they even do that? sure like, yeah follow us not this guy <laughs> yeah well it's like it becomes it becomes curated but what is the true um what is the true value to the the person whose work is being yeah that's why exploited I never it. It, like i never yeah. i get those invites all the time like hey we're starting this new platform that you know yeah. will expose the work to the world like dude i don't need that like yeah honestly you're you're taking my work and you're using it for your own, your own benefit because obviously you're you're trying to start a business and i you know i get yeah. that but it's just yeah. like well I'm which not, is exact the yeah. irony is is the irony is is that's exactly what i'm trying to do yeah <laughs> but it's a little different like it's, exactly. it's it's different when you start a profile and then just randomly pick work and and start posting yeah. as yours you know yeah 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 so and the difference is is a tag which is like barely ever every barely ever in, anyone pays attention to by the way yeah. people ask questions that are answered in the description or the image itself <laughs> yeah. like when that happens then you can imagine that at least half of people don't even look at the tags you know right yeah so i've seen i've seen actually uh one case where um a piece was curated three levels deep if that makes sense so it was like it was an artist work that was really popular but mm -hmm. then a curated site picked it like a curated profile and then another curated profile grabbed it from that site thinking that that site was the one that made it. And then the third <laughs> site grabbed it from the second site thinking that that was the site that made it. So it was like two or three levels removed from the actual artist. So yeah, I think, you know, like when I said this is something that we're actually doing is, but we're not doing it in a way, again, I'll go back to me. This is a platform that I want to use so that I can, you know, thrive and I can continue to make stuff. Um, I can continue to make stuff and have the stuff that I made for me actually do something for me in the background. And that's, it's the same for any other artists out there. It's like, you know, yeah. this isn't benefiting us unless it benefits you. And that's, that's the best thing about it is it's going to take a lot of work up front. But I really believe that, um, yeah, I believe that the artists that are on there are, are truly crushing it, you know, in their own unique way. It's not whether they have a million followers or f 25 followers. It's mm -hmm. the artists are actually doing something unique and authentic that, um, you know, and they're kind of originators. They have their own voice that should be recognized. So, yeah. 
yeah i guess the biggest difference and i hope it's pretty obvious but it just has to be said you know like as an artist and, and, you, just, and you said it perfectly this is the site that i'm building because i want to you know this is what i would want to use if mm -hmm. it was just me um i did we we did the same pretty much with learn squared when we started the the company with ash and and andrew and and anthony right now it's just me and andrew but mm -hmm. still like when we started a company we were thinking about that 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 thing uh, as well like what can we build something that we are going to be excited about you know can mm -hmm. we build this place where the the content that is in there not only is benefiting others uh you know who are contributing to it and you know we, we, we try to be as as probably the, the most competitive when it comes to the market when it, uh on how we 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 work with our instructors i would say we are probably the most competitive in terms of like how we split split costs and everything mm -hmm. um i might be wrong there, there might be a platform that does it better but to mm -hmm. my to my knowledge we're, we're trying to be up there mm -hmm. um but we were also we were also building it because like we are excited about it you know we 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 talk with artists that we know are but are great and we can learn from you know i i'm personally uh, um self taught i never yep. went to any school i never had a luxury to actually have money to go to school you know right. i i always was this poor if i would want to take a credit i would never get it because it's just like I had nothing to back it up with. So I kind of had to rely on myself almost completely throughout life and kind of like dig myself out of, you know, post-communist country with a yeah. lot of debt and find my voice in the world, you know, become better at what I am. And, and eventually, you know, it led me to where I am right now. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a ton of people that are, are in the exact same spot. And they mm -hmm. it's so easy to find content. Like, don't get me wrong. Like... If you want to, it's the same goes to your your platform. Like, hey, if you want to license someone else's work, right? If there's a client who want to license the work, they can find it everywhere. Mm -hmm. But the difference is this. It's like there's so much content out there right now. Like it mm -hmm. used to be that you would find content sporadically. And then if it was a good content, then it would really stand out, right? Yeah. But now there's just so much stuff out there. There's just so yeah. much. It's almost impossible to to be sure that you, what you're, you know, diving into is actually legit or not, because there's just so many con artists there as well. You know, yeah. Like yeah. just do a, do yourself a favor and look at any of the YouTube channels that explain. I don't know. Like just they go over, let's say, gear reviews, right? That's yeah. like the most popular one right now, because yeah. you can obviously make a lot of money doing that if you're if you're smart. Yeah. So pr props to that. You, you have to be actually pretty smart and, and engaging, engaging to, for for people to to uh, really uh, you know take notice. Mm -hmm. But what happens a lot is like there is millions of opinions and everyone is saying different thing. And then it's like, okay, so yeah. is this like you know when you research something, you want to like let's say you want to buy a camera, right? Mm -hmm, you, mm -hmm. you go you go to the the the, the new one. Um, what's it called? The Black Magic. Yeah. Yeah. The the, the new four uh, K awesomeness yeah yeah i'm Wanted. pretty sure i'm pretty sure before you bought it you you spent ton of time researching what it is right right and you right. went through those videos like through a butter it was like oh let's fucking learn everything everything because yeah. you're making an investment you know and you yeah, want to be sure yeah. how, like how many of those videos were like completely contradicting one another i was like totally. okay so is it good or is it bad like i don't know yeah. anymore and yeah. it's just like I there's always like a personal agenda you know yeah, for sure. I looked at just looked at the footage, really, you right. know. Um, but I think, I think that's paralysis by analysis. I, you know, we, there was another talk uh, I think we had on the Learn Squared stream where it's just like, mm -hmm. you know, you could sit there and, but you have like you can always take it back. Like <laughs> that's, that's what I say. You right. can always just take it back. You're not locked into that thing. Like try, like you can give it a try. Maybe you can, you know, swap it out for something else. But I don't know. It's just uh, I, I've learned that not every every tool that you have is going to solve every problem that you have for right. that specific thing. So you have to like prioritize what are like the top four priorities. If I'm buying a TV, if I'm buying a tool, if I'm using software, mm -hmm. like what are the top maybe three or four things? Because nothing's going to check off all the boxes. Yeah. Right. So, but you, you see know, my point, right? Yeah. Like, 100%. There's just so easy to get lost. And it's, it goes the same with learning so like whether you're learning software or trying to figure out you know 
am I going on the right path with, you know, learning those tools or this way of thinking? How mm. do I know that the person that is talking to me, are they, are they so good that they actually know or mm -hmm. are, are they just a good popular person that they, they speak from authority because they are popular, not because they have experience doing that, you know? Sure. And that's, that's where you, you can get lost real, real quick. And, um, and I think yeah, it's coming back to w w when you were, when you were talking about those platforms, those, those third party, you know, Hey, like I'm starting a blog and in this blog, I'll display like other people's work and tag it if, if I wanted to, you know, and like, and then like, the value of the work becomes the value of like the artist is not getting what they they should be getting out of that mm -hmm. the, all the value goes towards the owner but th there is a difference between like let's say if you if you do something like that and you are an artist yourself with mm -hmm. a reputation mm -hmm. versus if you're a random person behind the nickname or behind a hashtag or behind a you know avatar mm -hmm that no mm -hmm. one knows who you are. You have no personal, like no professional experience uh, anywhere whatsoever. So it's very easy for you to sort of like, oop, uh, let me fold it and start somewhere somewhere else, you know? Right. And no one will ever know who you were and why you did what you did, you know? Right, but what they will remember is the, the name of the, whether it's an Instagram profile or a business where they saw your work. That's right. what they'll remember. They'll be like, "Oh yeah, I was over. I was over at yeah, blah blah blah," and they'll be like, "Oh, that's a great site for inspiration. Yeah, you should follow them." It's not that they're following you as the artist. It's really that they're yeah. Yeah, yeah, building. Yeah. They're building something. And I put this on my Twitter. I think a couple of days ago, I said, "Look, like this this new word, like you know, feature. Like we're gonna feature your work. We'd love to feature <laughs> your work in our real. It's a you know, we'd love to feature your stuff on our profile. And and it's a very delicate balance because I know there's not like there's, you know, there's, there's not, you know, you can't paint everything with the same brush, but I mm -hmm. see so many times where companies or people will be like, Hey, I'd like to feature your work on my thing. Can, you know, and you know, what we'll do is we'll show your work to all of our followers. And the issue is that the problem is, is that the risk is all on you is what I say. The risk is all on you that you're going to make a transaction and the transaction is that they get something They've gotten something, right? So yeah. you give them something. They already got value by you yeah. saying yes. Yeah, so they've That's got your they thing. Need. Yeah, they've got your thing. And then they also, they're likely going to be the one that values or gets value from, you know, whatever traffic, analytics, blah, 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 blah. But yeah. what you're hoping is that what they're valuing for sure from is going to then somehow trickle down and also create value for you. And the chances are pretty slim. You know, the chances of, of, of that actually being like, okay, I'm going to go follow that person likely rather than just following the awesome curated thing, you know, is, is pretty low. So, and whether like, and it goes to advertising, it, usually it's just a form of advertising. It doesn't matter what, if you're featuring something somewhere, you're trying to advertise a product, you're trying to advertise, you know, your brand, you're trying to advertise your community, right? You're trying to ad advertise your software, and I think it's pretty, I think it's pretty, um, get something, get something. Don't, you know, don't just give it away. Yeah. Don't you know? say yes, because you're going to be featured. I'll, I'll, and you, 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 you put it like you put it right on the button with this dude. Like when someone features your work, even if their profile is like 5 million followers, let's say, right. Let's say it's a huge, huge, huge profile and they offer you, Hey, like we're going to feature your work. We have five million followers. You're gonna get a lot of traffic. Are right. you? But like, uh, the, qu the question I would ask is, how did they get to five million followers? Well, uh, no, I, I, that's a legit question too. But but another question is like, are are the followers of that profile gonna follow you, or yeah. are they are following because they have uh, this randomized dose of of you know awesome art being totally, delivered totally. to them? You know. I Right. The vast that's what majority I'm saying. You, of the people yeah. are only there for that. They don't care about who's the artist anymore. Hundred percent. So that's my point: is how did they get to five million followers? Is because on day one they reached out to one artist, and then day two they reached out to another artist, and they continued to build something that was on the backs of a bunch of little tiny bite-sized chunks that they built mm -hmm. by not ever having to, you know, transact on content.
Yeah, exactly. And they got, they got something. They got something for nothing over and over and over again. So they were able to build something that had five million followers. And by the way, them reaching out to artists—that's freaking rare. <laughs> like, like when yeah. that happens, they are at least trying to be legit one way or, or another. You know, yeah. versus versus um, just like oh, it's there, it must be free. Let me post it. You know. <laughs> yeah, and the issue is, it's going to be like impossible to control. You know what I mean? It's going to be very difficult to control. And I think that that's why um, when we're talking about Avant Forum, it's it's not the artists that are on there already understand this. You know, they already get that this is kind of a thing that they are trying to avoid. Um, and yeah, it's just hopefully uh, hopefully uh, ours, you know, that are coming up and trying to figure out this this crazy space of Instagram and trying to figure out how to, you know, monetize their work or monetize their craft. You know, I'm hoping that they look at other places, you know, and maybe ours will be one of it to understand the true value behind their work um, in any case, whether it's a small use case or a large use case and whether it's commercial or, you know, whatever um, that they can yeah. start to go, oh, shit. Like, you know, when I when I licensed my first image, I was like, what? Like, this is a thing. What? Like, it's no, it's not worth that. Yeah, sure. It is done. You know, and and I'm. Uh, there's a lot of trust here, which is is a hard word to kind of get around. Sometimes people are like, I don't know if I trust you, but at the end of the day, like uh, the conversations that I've had, you know, face to face with majority of these artists, is like, you know, guys, like I want us to crush it. I want us all to crush it, um, and I want us to thrive on this the place. And and I'm willing to kind of put, m I think, my head on the chopping block a bit to to try and make that happen yeah, for us. Yeah, you kind of you kind of are like when yeah. you're putting your name on the on the on the company that is doing this. Like you mm. better you better be doing something right, you know? Yeah, I'm sure you've experienced that with Learn Squared, right? Like yeah, of course, of course. Like you know, we we try to make. Like we always try to do, develop something, make cha make little changes, you know. Sometimes make ch bigger changes, and it's always a, a, an experiment, you know. But one thing we're not making and we'll never make is rip off the our instructors, you know. Like mm -hmm. we are pretty transparent with with pretty pretty much every single instructor we work with, and we never we never engage, you know. Like one of the surprising parts about and, and I don't want to talk too much about myself and the company and whatnot, but you know, before I've started doing, you know, before we started doing this market where we develop courses and have classes and we have instructors, we talk with them and, you know, help them to, to build the classes. Right. You know, like I was, I was, I was offered to do courses for other platforms, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not going to, I'm not going to name names, but quite a few of them had a clause where it would basically say like, as long as you're on this platform, you cannot teach anywhere else, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of companies do that. You'll be surprised how many, how many do that, you know? Yep. And that, that was one of the things we, when we started the company where we said like, we don't care, you know, you obviously cannot take the, the class itself and start selling it elsewhere. That would, <laughs> that would kill the business, right? Yeah. yeah, like, yeah. What would stop you from like cutting the prices or, you know, putting it on YouTube for free, whatever, like whatever, whatever, whatever. Right. Yeah. Like there's, there's, there's always a business part of it, but, but generally speaking, like if we have an instructor, we don't say like, Hey, you cannot teach anywhere else. Like, no, you can't, you can, mm -hmm. as long as you're not taking the video content that you created for the class and like literally posting it elsewhere, mm -hmm. you're fine. Like we don't care. Yeah. You're not like under yeah. that company's umbrella, you know? Exactly. Cause that's just like, to me, that kind of practice is sleazy as fuck. Like, I well, at well, at the end of the day, if you if you are treating if you're treating the the people who are providing content the best you know opportunity as possible, and you're and you're working for them, right? That yeah. will always trump, I think, whether it's a few dollars somewhere else. I'm hoping, you know, sometimes maybe not, but I'm hoping that 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 relationship and that guidance and that transparency and that support and that constant like just the value that you create for them, yeah. that will always, um, you know. That will always, uh, in my eyes, be more valuable than getting 10% somewhere else, you know, or whatever it is. No, oh, yeah, for sure. And we don't stop people from trying either. You know, like that's that's the point. Some artists want to explore different avenues. And like the worst thing you can do is the worst you can do 
or the worst thing you can do to an artist is, is just to tell them like you cannot be creative because you signed a contract you know it's like mm. like that's the worst that's the worst kind of deal that every artist will ever get you know so right. just, just out of that principle whether they're gonna like the experience uh they have with the company or not that's 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 a completely separate subject you know we have we do have instructors that come back and do classes you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That means that for us is a is 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 an information that they they've en they've been enjoying the experience. But if they find a platform that is more beneficial to them specifically, because everyone is so different, you yeah. know. And some 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 artists that we that we worked with, like I think Jama is a great example. You know, he started teaching with our platform and took some of the principles, learned how you know how we do stuff, and and you know learned about the quality of work and everything and we you know not only not only we try to help him but you know it eventually became his own voice and now he has his own platform it's doing really well and just kudos to that guy dude yeah i fucking love jama love yeah, what yeah. he's doing and you know and uh and some artists just just want to do that specifically yeah uh, you know build their own their own identity out there and not just be a part of, of someone else's, you know, umbrella, yeah. as you said, you know? Well, and that brings up a good point. Like with, again, without going into logistics, and this is really important because good artists, they don't, you know, there's this balance between, um, kind of being, being supported and being like, Hey, this is what we think you should do Yeah. without feeling like, you know, that they're being told what to do, but they also, <laughs> you know, they also want, sometimes to be told what to do and, and get that guidance and say, look, I, you know, and so not every artist is the same. Not every artist, you know, is going to, you know, f have the same perspective on value of their work. Right. Mm -hmm. Some artists may say like, ah, oh, this is just, you know, I, I feel like, so we, you know, we are doing some very interesting things for artists to get that, um, support and guidance while still feeling autonomous on the platform and not feeling like they're segmented because artist X might feel, might be different than artist Y. So how do you, how do you give them the opportunity to really like be like, okay, I still feel like artist X and I still feel like artist Y and I feel still, I still feel like my work is being, um, represented the way that I want it to be represented on the mm -hmm. platform from a value point. Um, so it's a, it's it's going to be um, a really exciting space and yeah I think it's uh, I think that that's always going to be something that artists look for right like you know how do they have their own voice inside of their right. development you know um, and still feel supported yeah it's pretty important pretty important mm -hmm. dude mm -hmm. I'm I'm excited super yeah. excited where, where where it's gonna go you know you i've it's it's a kind of a market that you, you have a lot of those places where it's a commodity market but mm -hmm. what you are guys are doing or you're doing and you know what your guys are building is, is is a little more sophisticated and different and more oriented towards a thriving community rather than a business you know which is I yeah. think the biggest difference between you know avant form and let's say like any of those platforms that for free templates for wordpress <laughs> oh god yeah no it's it's um yeah it's highly curated and i think that that if the quality always stays high and the artists are always able to feel like they're surrounded by artists that are going to you know artists and work that are going to not only elevate um their their work mm -hmm. but also challenge them to elevate their own work then i think you know when i look at the artists on on our landing page i'm just like I got to pick up the pace, you know, I really have to like, you know, I just have to make sure that I'm carving out my own corner, you know, so we're not playing the Charlie Brown game of soccer, you know, where everyone's doing what everyone else is doing. It's like, you know, there's enough people on our platform doing that. There's enough artists doing this. There's enough doing yeah. that. So, you know, and growing it so that each person continues to kind of go down their own path because it's, um, it's, it's, it's the only way that those artists will thrive in their corner if they're the, you know if they're only playing there with a, a few people rather than a whole you know you know like you said a bunch of you know whether it's people clones or you know vitali babies or anything like that <laughs> it's um yeah you got to give each artist a, 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 a space to play yeah dude excited totally yeah i am too man I wish you all uh, the best with this because like yeah. I, I only wish there was more platforms like that as well you know 
There's not yeah. that many, but I don't. They they eventually. <laughs> you know, the problem is like if you, it's it's like with, with like the great startups. Usually, a great startup is made by someone who is super excited about something specific, and they always yep. always wanted to make that part of life easier for themselves, mm. and they're always orienting it towards what they would be the happiest about. You know. And mm -hmm. that's how you get those companies that are just amazing and they work well and make our lives easier. You know, that's usually yeah. the reason why they, they start and become so successful. But well, it comes like from, a, yeah, it comes from a, a it comes from a, uh, a, 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 a place that's rooted in like passion and authenticity rather mm -hmm. than, you know, um, just like, Oh, you know, we're going to do what they're doing. It's like, no, no, no. Like uh, I want, I, I want to make sure that I do really well inside of this platform and, and my, my work gets out to where it's supposed to get to you and that it's, you know, it's, it's elevated and put in, in front of the right companies, the right places, and that I can experience, you know, all of the benefits of licensing without all the headaches of licensing and have it kind of totally automated in the background, mm -hmm. yeah, you know? That makes sense. Yeah, I just want to, any artist that wants to keep making stuff, you know, if they want to keep just focus on making and developing, you know, without having to manage all the logistics of things like this, it's, it's just, it's a no brainer for me personally. Yeah. yeah. And to the, to that point, you know, I know it from personal experience, you know, it from personal experience as well. Like mm -hmm. we as artists are completely stupid when it comes to business. It's Ugh. so difficult for us to understand you know, it it comes with character traits, man. I I I truly believe in that. Like be, mm -hmm. because we like when you're creative, your brain is wired differently than if you're not creative and you're more like on the business end. You know, like when I talk, um, I had an opportunity to talk with some really smart business people. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and not not business people meaning like oh like I'll advise you what to do. No, I'm talking about people who made gazillions you know? <laughs> yeah yeah and just like it's very fascinating to see how they operate they are as obsessed about making money mm. it's almost like their passion to create wealth it's, right. it's like your passion to create awesome art it's, it's yep. their passion to create wealth and they will find yep. every single tool available in order to make it happen and then right. do compromises where where it's necessary you know yeah and i think i think that's becomes that where it becomes a problematic aspect for artists because there's one aspect that almost every artist doesn't want to compromise on, which is like the quality of the work or like the principles that drive us to do stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, yeah. and oftentimes what seems to an artist to be a cheesy thing or like, Oh, like, is it even a thing? is something that business people is like yeah of course like this is what you do like stupid you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, yeah yeah it's and it's very thing. hard to understand for us it's just like i think it's we're we're just wired differently we just want to make stuff we just want to yeah. make stuff right like like i think that that's the issue is that when you're spending time uh, you know and you are spending more time doing something this is like that whole do you want to be a master of business or do you want to be a master of creativity you know and and while there will always be tools around to help us with the business side of it um i think that it's like yeah how much how much time do you want to spend whether it's licensing or just you know drafting contracts or yada yada you know how much time do you actually want to spend buried in in administrative stuff yeah that's true, man. Yeah. Um, I think it's a good note to think about ending this. We've been talking for oh, a little shit. over yeah. two hours almost. <laughs> uh, that went by quick. Yeah, it's time's flying when 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 it comes to when it comes to this. Uh, yep. There's a few questions. I'll, I'll let's just glaze quickly through them, sure. and then we can we can wrap it up. Okay. Um, it's been a good talk, though. Like I really, yeah, man. yeah. Huh. We we touched upon some some really important topics. Um, okay, let's start with this one uh, and from Nigel. Do you know if character rendered images have potential in this market? Things like sci-fi and fantasy? Yeah, dude, uh, 100%. So I think I, I've seen, especially like if you look at uh, some of the licensing situations out there, like the first image that I licensed was an Android's hand. You know, it was just a hand, but it was for an automotive company that was doing like these concept stores. 
mm-hmm. you know, so I, I, every artist that I've spoken to, they're like, well, I'm not sure if my, like, would, would people license my images? And I'm like, I don't know. I can't tell you like yes or no, but what I can tell you is it, it it's more likely to happen if it's somewhere like this, because it will be put in front of people who will likely do that. Yeah. Um, and I've seen, you know, when it comes to, and you may know this from like concept work and character work is that IP is huge, right? So yeah. if you create a character, you know, um, uh, it can be licensed in like video games or in films, or it could be like even the image that you make could just be used to license and, and promote a, uh, a new film, you know, and then that, that thing could evolve over time. But mm-hmm. I believe everything, um, has a, has a place, you know, and I'm not, I've always thought like, oh, maybe this image can be used for something. But when I saw Mike's work get used for the Louis Vuitton stuff, like the, <laughs> I was like, you know, I, there's no correlation. No one would look at like people's dystopian, you know, uh, landscapes and go like oh yeah you know what i totally could picture that on a louis vuitton (laughs) (laughs) t-shirt you know so i think i think it's important to not limit your own um application of where things could be used Mm -hmm. but um you know you can everything's got value for sure yeah i think more importantly like would you would you change the craft to get licensing where you think the licensing should be and then regret with the fact that now you have to do that all the time because that's what people are knowing you for, you know? Yeah. I think the most successful, like, so if you take prediction, right, like the application or the pro what unfolded there was that, uh, it was that 51 49 thing. It was, I had an idea in my head that I wanted to execute, but I actually wasn't even at 49% execution. I was at like 10. So I had to do the class to elevate it so that my execution at least matched or closely enough matched my idea Mm -hmm. so that, you know, Mike's class, I could benefit from it. And what was produced was well, but the issue was there was, or the, the, the thing was there's a concept behind it. There was an idea of machine learning and that spoke very clearly to the, you know, whether it was data you know, just a general term, just data Mm -hmm. spoke to the companies that licensed it. Right. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, character work will always have a space to the companies that, you know, whether it's video games or, you know, uh, movies or IP for t-shirts, like, I don't know, but I do believe that, um, yeah, it all has value in, in, in unique scenarios as well. You know, like once the idea is great and it's executed pretty well, like, yeah, it's it's definitely going to happen. 100%. You know, it's it's uh, it maybe not on the license licensing front, but the vast majority of the the client work I've been getting recently is based on my personal work. You know. Yep. Yeah. So like even if you're not necessarily being licensed, uh, and I did license uh, one or two of my images already mm-hmm. uh, on a smaller scale, but 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 that can happen. Mm-hmm. But generally speaking, you know, to me, licensing was more of like, oh, we saw this, you know, this this IP you're working on, and we have this our idea of, you know, but it's in this style that you're yep. working in, and we would love to use your expertise to actually develop it, and and that becomes like its own thing now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that it has its based. own value. Exactly. Outside. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Is there any more questions? Do you um, make animations often or you focus more on look dev and still frames? Uh, I do do animations. I'm, I, I Mostly they're client side animations. And I would say about 90% of my work doesn't show up in my portfolio, mm-hmm. to be honest. Um, <laughs> I would say like most of my client work does not show up on my portfolio and it's not because i'm not like stoked on it it's like i'm i'm just trying to keep my portfolio as like unless it's like personal or something that you know maybe i collaborated on Mm -hmm. i think it's it's something that i'm i'm using as like continuous development rather rather than being maybe hired for something that i already did Gotcha. Um, because i find that that's where i start to plateau a bit is is that you end up doing versions of something you've already done years ago Mm-hmm. Yeah, that like makes the camp, sense. yeah. So like the camp titles, like that was like, I did those, and you know, a bunch of clients were like, "Oh, we really like curl noise," and it's like, "Yeah, okay, I can do that." But after a while, you're like, "Oh no, this is everywhere." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. I so. spoke with a couple of artists that have the, would dealt with exact same thing, you know, especially if you're known for something. Mm-hmm. Um, they would say like, you know, I did this work like two years ago. It was just blew up. 
And now every single offer I'm getting, it's like, hey, do this exactly the same thing. It's like, I yeah. already did that. Like, can you actually trust me to do something else? Yeah. It's like, I, cl I clearly crushed it, you know? That means <laughs> I have an ability to actually develop something that you will crush, crush with. Yeah. yeah. Like, let me even try. No, no, we have this lazy idea of doing this one thing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like a band playing the same song yeah. over and over. Like, and it's a cover song. It's like, can you play that song? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Joey, you said you've been DJing. Um, oh, does God. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, doesn't it help you with editing and animating? That's <laughs> such a weird question. Actually, no, it does. It's actually really <laughs> funny. You know, uh, it does. 100% it does. You know, uh, just understanding like the, like I did a, a project with um, HP and like Rufus mm -hmm. DeSoul in Coachella, which was really cool. But part of it was obviously you need to like animate to the song and, you know, uh, there was a bunch of tools that kind of helped me, but uh, you have to understand the structure of the song in order to right. like cut cut your scenes and and you know find triggers on which beat you know clap or yeah. I think naturally it's if you understand music, I think it's it's definitely helpful for sure. Yeah, it's just on the surface. It sounds yeah, it so sounds funny. Like, I've been a DJ now. I'm animating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, those were the days. Those are fun uh, times. And there yeah. is a follow-up question to it: do, um, do you start with music sto or storyboard first, or something else? Well, I will tell you if you watch, if you go purchase the Learn Squared m Workflow Animation Michael Wrigley's class. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, it's actually yeah, it's always boards. It's always boards, concepting and boards for animation. Yeah. yeah. So. No, I was just trying to do a shameless Learn Squared plug. Dude, anytime. I'm not <laughs> mad at this. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, boards is usually a thing. I think, uh, yeah, getting away, having a coffee, and just draw up some concepts first is important, always. Yeah, I think that's it for now. Um, so I'm sure if we stay longer, there will be more questions. I didn't actively ask for people to ask questions either, but I think I think we're good. What yep. happens often is um, when we are live and we discuss we discussed like different subjects people might have a question and they we we just end up asking or uh, answering answering that question before it's even asked so mm -hmm. uh, that happens often too okay awesome let's, dude let's wrap it up here that was a good yeah. one yeah dude, it was fun nice nice uh, nice catching up with you um i'm super excited about what you're doing with the new platform there's obviously more things yep. that are going on that might be affecting our business together let's put it this way <laughs> uh, yeah that's possible yeah for sure there's a possibility of that happening we'll discuss something, it. something simmering <laughs> yep <laughs> we'll, we'll definitely chat more about that when it's more refined let's yep. put it this way yeah um but otherwise yeah it's been it's but it's been nice catching up with you man and uh, i'm super happy where where the things are going for you uh, mm -hmm. I, I do remember exactly when you, you were taking the class and, you know, uh, Ash was raving about it as well. Like, oh, like this guy is, you know, he's look at that guy. He's actually getting like super good, you know? Yeah. And then like you just blew up and it's pretty awesome. And, you know, yeah. hearing that story of where you came from and how it, how it went, you know, it's kind of like it's it's it, I think it should be a pretty, ver pretty inspiring thing for people to to realize that it's never too late to start because like. I think there is this this thing where people think like you have to be really young to learn no. something. And if you're not young enough, then you missed out on way too much things. And now no. you cannot progress anymore. You know, uh, it's not like you're a super old fart either. But, <laughs> but, Thank you. but, but it, for the standard of where people are starting, like you have 15 year olds that are like already working in the industry. They are so good. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't matter that you have to be 15 or start so early to actually become that great, you know? Exactly. Unless you're Tiger Woods and you swing the swing the bat when you're like two year old, so yeah, that's yeah. a little different. Um, I love how you called it a bat. Uh, whatever that is, <laughs> a, a golf okay. thing, a club, <laughs> a club. Right. That's <laughs> all right. I have a I have a get out of jail of yeah, you saying do. stupid shit. That's awesome. Because I'm from potato country, so <laughs> <laughs> totally. Uh, yeah, just right, call guys. it what you want, dude. All right, man. Thanks so much. <laughs> yeah, we'll uh, we'll catch up on that other stuff. And yeah, yeah I appreciate appreciate you bringing me by it. today. It was, it was awesome as well. Good times. Yeah. Anyone who has been listening this, to this live, appreciate you guys for being here. It was quite a quite a quite a lot of you, uh, you know, talking on the chat and whatnot. 
really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. Uh, anyone who's made it through the whole video and or listened through the to to this through uh, other platforms like Spotify and and iTunes and whatnot, uh, thanks for listening as well. Um, next next week we have um, Nino coming on board. We're gonna talk about his story. It's pretty interesting as well. And then more guests lining up. As I mentioned, I'm trying to make those every week now. Uh, hopefully, it's gonna last as long as I can. Uh, I'm pretty sure eventually I'll <laughs> have to take a break again. But but yeah, it's I'm I'm having a lot of fun, learning a lot from from talking with different people. It's 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 really inspiring. So uh, I definitely do enjoy that. If you guys liked the podcast and enjoyed listening to it, subscribe, leave a like, leave a comment. You know, if you want to see someone on the podcast, leave a comment as well or a suggestion. That's always helpful. Um, and if you feel really adventurous, um, I'm doing monthly Q&As, uh, monthly AMAs, uh, usually last week of the month. I just started that thing and I'm trying to build the Patreon around that specifically. If you feel like you want to support the podcast, you can go to Patreon. It's in the links. Um, and if you want to be... On the first, on the first line of questions, meaning like you want to ask a question and never be missed out, then you can you can do that through the Patreon as well. Uh, I made it that made that specifically for that. Uh, but if you just want to listen and enjoy, you can skip all of that and just listen and enjoy. It's always free. So, all right, guys, thanks a lot. Hey, dude. Thanks for joining, and I will see you guys next time. Thanks, Mitchell. Bye, bye. Bye.